Hello, folks. We're live. I'm Bradley J, and this is Mike Coyne of the Massachusetts School of Law. He's actually the dean. The show's called Ignore the Machine, and we're going to talk about the conflict between fair trials and free speech. And we're going to look at two cases, or two situations, it might involve actually more cases than that, as examples. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the Mass School of Law, Massachusetts School of Law, and how it how it might be different than other schools, and what, what students might be attracted. What what kind of students might benefit from the your model? Well, a lot of, a lot of students would because what we do here is we have brought the medical school approach to education to law school, so that um, our professors continue to practice law. Um, we have judges that are teaching classes, just like a medical school would have practicing doctors and. Uh, academicians in class, as well as folks who are then spending time in the clinic. And so what students get the benefit of is real world practical knowledge on a day to day basis. And then they can practice those skills. We have a couple of courtrooms here. We have a couple of boardrooms here that students can actually practice the skills that lawyers have to have. And they do it with a net. So if they make mistakes, no one's spending a million dollars on a judgment or going to jail at the end of the day. What they can do is practice their craft and get better at it while in law school so that when they do leave law school, not only do they have the theory of what law entails, but they also have a great deal of practical knowledge and practice at doing the types of things that lawyers do, whether it's in a district court making bail arguments or a superior court conducting a trial or a boardroom trying to negotiate a solution to the case, those skills are learned uh, and honed while they're in law school. So we, our approach is different because we strongly uh, encourage and teach the professional skills that lawyers need, not just the, the academic side of it. And I, it's different because the people who are teaching are different than our, would be traditional at most law schools because they continue to, to gather and uh, master the craft of being a lawyer so that they can provide that information to the students. So if you're a person who thought maybe you'd be interested in a career in the law, maybe you want to reach out to Mike Coyne <laughs> or, or his colleagues up there at sure. the uh, the Mass Massachusetts School. Call them up. You know, maybe, I don't know if you can talk to them, but somebody there will, will speak to you and give you an idea of what it might be like. And I know that you have a lot of students that are not kids you have a lot of adult students right yeah we have both a day and an evening program the average age uh, at matriculation is 32 33 years old so it's older than your traditional student body and many of the students in the evening uh, have full-time jobs as well whether it's in law enforcement or in a hospital or mm. at some one of the businesses between here and worcester um, and what they do then is they, they have a more of a practical real world experience as well uh, that they can bring to bear uh, as they learn law as well. So we have a really interesting dynamic in the classroom, not just from a standpoint of all the various professions that are that are present in the classroom, but also we are by far the most diverse law school in New England uh, with respect to uh, race, with respect to age with respect to uh, country of origin, uh, what we think is law schools should look a lot more like the communities they purport to represent. And, and we put that into real action around here. And can you repeat the, not, it's not a parable, I guess, the little story about the person who might say, oh, gee, I'm too old for this? Oh, sure. I'll tell you, and I always use it. It's Eddie Starr, who was he was working for the telephone company when he decided to come to law school. Um, and um, he was a union member, a union um, leader. And, uh, you know, he talks about he's in law school and it's his first week and it's orientation and it's really hard and difficult. And he hadn't been in school in a while. And so Eddie goes home and tells his partner, um, look, I don't think I can do this. This is just too much work. He said, you know, I'll be 50 uh, before, by the time I graduate law school. Um, and his partner looked him back in the eye and said, and Eddie, um, if you don't finish this, you'll be 50 and you won't be a lawyer. There you uh, go. That's and, a good. And it is great. And he has, Eddie sends me things all the time 
because now he's not only a union organizer and a leader, uh, he, because of his uh, law degree, he has a lot more value to the union and its members, and he's dealing with all sorts of interesting legal issues a lot more often. Uh, and so he's constantly sending me different articles about the problems unions are facing in the litigation and the like. So he's, he's really putting his knowledge into action. Um, and using the skills the way we hope is that we hope that people come to law school because they want to make a difference, um, not just in their own lives, but for the, the communities they serve, that they spring from, and really be able to help folks. And Eddie's just one of the many doing that out there. Um, and so he would tell people it's never too late. And, and I think that's right, because at the end of the day, whether you're a lawyer by the time you're 40 or 50, you still have another, these days, 20 to 40 years of productive uh, work ahead of you. Um, and it's obviously a very interesting career to be a lawyer, probably easier ways to make money than handling people's problems. But it is, at the end of the day, you get a, quite, a great deal of satisfaction out of helping people. Eddie Starr. Eddie Starr. Okay. Good guy. So, so we're going great. to take a look at fair trial versus free speech, and we'll take a look at them. The Trump situations, plural, and a, a very interesting case in Canton, I believe. Karen, yep, Karen Reed case. Karen Reed case. That is wildly interesting and has <laughs> a couple of uh, different sort of aspects to it. They both do, and that's, that's what's interesting. I think people would at first blush say, well, what could a, a criminal case down in Canton have to do with the former leader of the free world and their all of the various legal matters that he's facing. Um, but they've obviously, the, the one thing they clearly have in common are they're very high profile cases uh, where people are, have strong feelings on both sides of the equation there uh, with respect to the case and the government's work in the case and what should be taking place. So uh, at the end of the day, even though one is a serious criminal case for murder and the other people would say it's a serious criminal case that borders on sedition and treason, but it's more about election fraud and the abuses in, in that process. Uh, but, but why does, how is there some similarity? Uh, well, to me, the similarity is you start to think about it. It's not just that they're both high profile, that the public has a great deal of interest in both cases. But the tension comes in, the question comes in is, well, why in Trump's case do we now have a gag order if we have a First Amendment? And why in the Karen Reed case is Turtle Boy, the reporter, the blogger, uh, facing criminal charges for his reporting, as he would see it, uh, about a matter that's in significant controversy and a huge level of interest whatever happened to the First Amendment and people's ability to comment on matters of public interest. And you probably that, better outline the Karen Reed case and, and explain who Turtle Boy is. Sure. Uh, Karen Reed is a woman down in uh, Canton who was living with her boyfriend who was a police officer. Late one night in January during a snowstorm, they came back from having consumed uh, alcoholic beverages and somehow... Uh, he died outside a friend's house. The government charges that it was done when she did a U-turn in the driveway of the house, hit him with the car, and he was left to die in the snowstorm by her, who hit him with the rear of her vehicle. And then ultimately, they discovered his body the next morning. Um, he, had, he had spent all night in the snow and ultimately then died whether it's by directly by his injuries or as a result of the injuries and then the exposure to the bitter cold that night. At the end of the day, he's dead. And then she is charged with the, his death. And um, the, they, his lawyers and his team, and I think it's fair to, to look at the um, turtle boy, the blogger, the reporter as part of the the people who have led the push to really take a hard look at, at the case because the the argument is she didn't kill him at all. He met his death inside the house that night and there's a cover-up uh, involved. And therefore, 
uh, they want to keep this all secret because some of those folks are have friends and are in law enforcement and people are not getting the truth on it. And it's created a real firestorm because, again, there are people on either side of the issue um, that feel strongly that either she is a murderer or she absolutely isn't. And as a result of a cover up, they're trying to railroad her. Um, and I think the defense has done a good job, uh, at least publicly and in the media, creating that that case for reasonable doubt. This is where the problem comes in. And it's the same problem with Trump is that are you poisoning the jury pool uh, by making all of these public statements and the public trying of the case in the press? Have you d done more damage to the right to a fair trial? Because it's not just the defendant who's entitled to a fair trial, but the people are as well. And so the district attorney has taken significant steps to try and reduce that poisoning of the well. But the latest one is to charge the uh, uh, turtle boy with uh, criminal charges of intimidation of witnesses and very serious charges. They're felony charges. It's very rare for a member of the media, obviously, to be charged with such offenses because of the First Amendment. And so uh, the question is, are they trying to intimidate him and silence him? He says he'll never be silenced. He believes he's in the right about reporting a matter of public interest. And uh, the government says, well, you're you're intimidating witnesses. You can intimidate witnesses by threats of violence, but you also can intimidate witnesses by harassment. And that's where I think the government's case against him uh, proceeds. Not that he made violent threats, but he's trying to make those witnesses and potential witnesses lives miserable. And therefore, that potentially means he's guilty of the felony charge of intimidation of witnesses. And, and so when you look at the case, if people dig a little deeper on the Karen Reed case, what they'll see is that we've got a matter that's going to trial. It's still a few months away, but that already positions have hardened with respect to what people think the evidence is. And obviously, until the case is tried, until the jury is sworn, and the evidence, the testimony and documentary evidence and expert testimony is presented before the court and received by the court, we don't really know what the true facts are. And, and so that becomes the question is, to the extent that the media uh, influences that jury improperly, well, that's where we have worries. It's a super gray area because in a lot of cases when judge judges make decisions it's pretty cut and dried but this is not cut and dried is the judge named beverly cannon i believe that's it is a spirit court judge yes okay in this paragraph judge beverly cannon said in a ruling on monday some monday that although it is true that the statements by the defendant's counsel this is the karen reed case Cited by the Commonwealth are arguably inflammatory and appear to have fueled much of the much publicity in this case. The court does not find at this time there is substantial likelihood that the statements will be materially will materially prejudice the proceedings. There's no way to know at all. None. None, whether it will or not. In no. in either in either I mean if I can see where intimidation, like if people are afraid that other people are going to come sneaking up to their house at night and try to kill them or injure them as a result of being inflamed by someone. I can see that. But sim but short of that, it's a, I don't see how you can decide whether or not the, the proceedings are materially prejudiced. Um, well, here's the problem with that. You know, we're not supposed to try our cases in the media. Um, but they also have a story that they want to get out and they want the public to really examine it quite carefully if their theory as to what took place with the death of the police officer is accurate. They, they want public support for being able to discover that information. The judge is right. You, we don't know, regardless of the extensive, and there have been extensive uh, communications by the lawyers in the case, about the strength and weakness of the case on both sides, from the district attorney's office as well as the defense lawyers. But at the end of the day, 
the question is, despite massive publicity, um, will we be able to ensure a fair and impartial jury? Not one that doesn't know anything about the case, because that's not what our right is. And we've seen this, whether it's the marathon bombing case or pick any one of your other high profile cases, the Whitey Bulger case we've tried here, that that th the fact is, at the end of the day, you don't want or are entitled to a jury who knows nothing about a case. What you're in entitled to get is a jury who, despite what they know, will set aside that and rule only on the evidence. So, so the fact is, is that in part, we don't know that what all of the extensive publicity, both here and in the Trump cases, has made it such that we won't be able to find that fair and impartial jury. The fact is, what we will have to do is work a lot harder to find a jury that will come in and put aside what they know and judge the case only on the evidence introduced at trial. So it'll take a greater effort. Um, to How do, do you that. test that? Uh, well, by questioning the jurors, by really trying to examine carefully uh, what their biases and prejudices are and what they already know about the case. Uh, and this is the problem, and we saw it in the Bulger case. We've seen it in, the, in other cases. There are some people, especially in, in both of these cases, whether it's Karen Reed or Donald Trump, there are people who would be dying to get on the jury, who would be dying to have their 10 minutes of fame, uh, and also may want to have some say in the outcome of that case. Well, <laughs> those are precisely the people that shouldn't pass the test. And that's why we have to very carefully question them, look into their backgrounds, and try to make an evaluation. And part on a gut level and part on our brains and intuition as to whether we think these people will be able to fairly view the case. But, but we did it in Bulger, and then at the, the end of the case, we had one of the jurors talk about uh, that she was in love and, you know, just bizarro stuff. And it, it, this happens in high profile cases. You get a level of interest that is way beyond the norm. And I could see it in both of these cases, the Trump case, as well as the Karen Reed case, that we're going to have a more difficult process in ultimately obtaining a jury that is free of that taint. Obviously, the more publicity, the greater the likelihood of the taint. But at the end of the day, what that means is the trial judge and the lawyers have to work harder at making sure that we uh, remove the people who are desperate to be jurors for the wrong reasons. And we make sure that we protect both the government and the defendant's right to a fair trial uh, by making sure that the folks we ultimately impanel will uh, hear the case and resolve the case only on the evidence received at trial not all the uh, reports and rumors and innuendo they've heard outside uh, in the various forms of media, which, which is in part the problem as well, right? All, it's, we're not just, we don't just have traditional media anymore. Um, the fact is uh, that uh, Trump has his own uh, vehicle for releasing all his thoughts. Um, social media has gained a significant influence over the proceedings. And maybe that's why sort of the rules are a little more in flex and we we see that looks like we have more problems than we've had in the past because but but part of that is because we have a lot more people who are able to provide information and report on matters of public interest that isn't necessarily a bad thing the question is well where's the line between legitimate inspection of matters of public interest and then prejudicing folks right to a fair trial and that gets us into the, the gag order that Trump faces. Is that fair that uh, a litigant is enjoined from making certain comments? Is it is it fair to bring an outsider who is a, a member of the press to have to face criminal charges, at least in part, designed to prevent any further reporting or significant um, reporting on the case? And that they both raise legitimate issues with respect to the public's right to know, and it's always been presumed that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Why don't we let the president speak? And why don't we let Turtle Boy write yeah. the reports and let people see the information and make their own judgment? In the search for a clear line, it would seem to me that the clearest would be, and maybe the, the easiest to get to, is the line between 
opinion and intimidation. That would that would seem that you have the right to opine, but not to intimidate. And that is probably the clearest thing, the easiest thing to figure out. Is that intimidating or not? Is that personally intimidating? Is that going to harm, cause harm to any participant? That think, seems like you could figure that out. I think you're right on the demarcation. The question, though, becomes what for intimidation to one person might be different from intimidation to someone else. The uh, goal, the objective might be intimidation, but if it's couched in the form of opinion, is that then legitimate? I think what we'd find where the rubber meets the road here, that your theory about the line of demarcation is correct, where we would see it would potentially depend on a fact-specific, person-specific okay. inquiry in every case. So the supplying of information that would aid in someone causing harm, like an address, giving out addresses, uh, and things like that. Well, yes, and questioning in some of this, questioning whether they're act, the individuals are acting on behalf of the public or to taking untoward actions that would be in violation of the law and, and exhorting your um, followers. And in both cases, we, we see that happening here in both Karen Reed's case as well as the Trump case, in, encouraging your followers to, to act on the injustice that they're facing, uh, we know that at times that we, that we have an awful lot of people who are extremists um, that follow along and then do things that uh, they shouldn't be doing. Look at what took place on January 6th and all these folks whose lives have been ruined now because they're going to spend right. a decade or more in jail as they saw it acting on the directive of the president of the United States. Um, nonetheless, um, at this point, they're going to lose their houses. They're not going to see their children grow up and they're going to spend significant time incarcerated. Um, they did it in many cases because they believed they were acting on the direction of their leader. Mm. Uh, but that doesn't save them when so. So we have extremists. And the question is, when you pour gasoline on that fire, shouldn't you understand the consequences of, of those actions? And that's what um, we're looking at down in Norfolk Superior now with, unfortunately, uh, the reporters facing criminal charges, felony criminal charges for his activities. And Trump obviously is facing decades in jail in the various, from the various criminal actions. Um, and, and when the consequences are that severe, obviously people take drastic steps and you ha we have to be careful. We live in difficult times. The trickiest thing is the veiled calls to do harm to people, the veiled calls. Like that, maybe there could be some very specific, more specific language about to, to, help, to help judges decide whether this speech was a, a veiled threat or not. But of course, that's that's difficult. You know, that's the tough part. Um, what is it that Turtle Boy <laughs> said, and what are the char actual charges against him as a result? There, there are a number of intimidation of witness charges, and it's at least it's alleged that he was making the information regard the names of these information uh, witnesses public. He was making the locations of the witnesses public and where they could be found and that that uh, and then calling them and trying to suggest and 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 t and, a and forcing as the government would see it uh, their hands in a certain way. Um, there's a fine line between investigative reporting and trying to harass people so that they either walk away from the case or uh, refuse to be the witnesses because of the invasion into their personal life. It's it's an interesting test case for the the right of the media and especially the new media to try to uncover information and to try to report matters of public interest. I think we'd all agree generally that reporters shouldn't face criminal charges for matters carried out in the ordinary course of their business, but the case will ultimately turn on the end of the day whether that in fact was the case or whether he became part of the defense team. And that part is the argument as well, is that 
he, he's not an unbiased role here. Is he's made a great reputation now in stirring the pot, in uncovering matters of public corruption, and this one focuses directly on that. And so it, it, the question will become: Will he actually face trial, or will at some point the government? choose to either reduce the charges or dismiss the charges once the case has been tried and we have a result. It's we don't really know where it ends up at this point. We but also don't we also don't know, by the way, whether Trump, who I think continues to violate the gag order, um, will actually he's been fined, as I think everybody knows, for um, not removing information from the website in response to the court's order to try and not intimidate court personnel um, or the witnesses. And so he's been fined already $5,000 to, to, to him. It's nothing to most people. Um, it, it still is uh, a fair sum, but to a billionaire, it obviously isn't much. Right. But I think there it's the, it's the first step that, you know, next time the fine might be larger. And then the third time he, he may well spend the night incarcerated for violating the, um, gag order which we know is likely to take place since uh his numbers go up each time <laughs> you know do you think he wants to get arrested and spend a night in the pokey i i think there may be but i don't know whether his numbers continue to go up every time he um faces an additional criminal charge or additional party decides to roll over and take the police or to avoid incarceration I, I think that's starting to turn. You're seeing smaller crowds now. We saw a smaller crowd in New Hampshire when he submitted his nomination papers. Um, I, I don't know whether, I think at some point, and we may be there where people are saying, as Chris Christie said, okay, whether it's criminal or not, this is conduct unbecoming of the person who should hold the highest office in the land. And, and I think that that resonates with people is that, um, it can't all be politically motivated. Even yesterday, as the third of his lawyers pled out, if you looked at Twitter, people are still saying, oh, the case is a fabricated case. There's nothing here. Three lawyers don't plead out to criminal charges, uh, including felonies, uh, unless they've made an assessment of the case and with the expectation that if they go to trial, they're likely to be incarcerated. They made the deal because they know this is not a witch hunt. Uh, and if it is a witch hunt, sometimes there are actually witches which yeah. are hunt down. And, uh, and I think lawyers don't plead out uh, without making an assessment of their case because not only you know, will it cause them to be on probation for years, they are likely all going to lose their law license um, and their, their at least professional reputation now is whatever it was. And we could disagree about that. Um, whatever it was is completely destroyed um, when you're pled out to such serious criminal matters. One thing that I found irritating was Jenna Ellis's little thing uh, that she read at the end, weepily, about how she, sh you know, she paid attention to more experienced lawyers and she, you know, completely passed the buck. It was disgusting, I thought. <laughs> it was like so... So will that help her? Like, no, I just, I wasn't that smart. I paid attention to other lawyers. Does that count? To me, it did. I know we're on very different sides of this. I found the actual expression of remorse, true, and I think it was true remorse um, by one of the Trump inside members as refreshing because <laughs> we rarely see it. And I could see where someone would get quite caught up, especially a young lawyer, quite caught up with the proximity to the president and such secret important matters and the conversations like that, where you could become intoxicated by the fame and the power and do things that you just shouldn't do. I mean, okay, I if she'd I said I was intoxicated by the fame and the power, I get it. Yeah, but but she, she deflected blame to other lawyers. Uh, yeah, but the, but the likelihood is, and I hear you, she was deflecting. However, um, the fact is, the way our profession works, it, it, there is a lot of the senior lawyers dictate certain things, and 
you tend to listen to them because they've walked these footsteps before. So I could see easily why a young lawyer could be taken in and, and would likely be taken in. With that said, as a lawyer, you're supposed to make independent judgments. You're supposed to factually and legally investigate the claims of your clients and make sure they are supported. You, you know, the fact is when we promise to take an oath to the Constitution and in our role as a lawyer, we are saying that we're going to do the right thing far more often than, than most people do. And obviously she failed in that assessment from the get-go. Mm. Whether she's a young lawyer or Rudy on the other end of the spectrum, they both should be punished. I do think her expression of remorse, I th found it, in, I found it a bit, I, I did find it sincere. Mm -hmm. And I think full of regret for what she did because she's found herself here. I think it will uh, cut a little bit of slack on the back end of this. Um, I mean, you must agree, the, the expression of true remorse, let's assume it is, that's refreshing because oftentimes we have people plea, we have people make a deal and then they say, oh, but it's all hooey, I never did anything wrong. Even, you know, even yesterday, some of the statements I heard that were being made by the former president, um, there's no no suggestion that anything, anything uh, would be rethought and done differently in the future when when most people, most of us would say, listen, if I'm facing four criminal charge, four cases with multiple criminal charges in each case, that could potentially mean I've spent the re will spend the rest of my life in jail. Most of us, most of us would reconsider some of the choices that got us into that situation. I don't see any of that with with, right. with the, the people closest to the former president being Rudy or the former president himself. Right. So back to juries. That's the kind, yeah. of, kind of central, uh, the center of our discussion. One, I, I would think that one of the best ways to find out if a juror was potentially prejudice either way, would be to look at social media. If they're, and, and do they require you to report your social media activities or your, your, your Facebook pages? Because they should. They, I agree they should, and they should start. They usually will start in paneling a jury with a, a jury questionnaire, and we will ask a lot of information so that we can look at that and make some level of investigation into the background. And I agree with you because we have found these situations now where people say, oh, I don't know anything about the case or I'm not biased at all. And then somewhere through the course of the trial, we find postings on Twitter or on their Facebook or right. Instagram or whatever. And it says, well, those statements weren't truthful when you said I don't have an opinion either way. And you wrote X, Y or Z about something on social media that says that the statements weren't truthful. And if if known, you wouldn't have been a member. So I don't disagree with you. And I think especially Karen Reed's case will be difficult. The Trump case will be enormously difficult to impanel a jury because there, there are few people that probably don't have an opinion one way or the other on the character of the former president. And so you'll have to especially be careful filtering that whole social media process and who should get to serve. Um, because that, in that case, what percentage of the population likely doesn't have an opinion already on his guilt or innocence? You know, you, a lot of times I say, well, there's 30% on either end of the extreme here that either like the pres former president or hate him. So you've got 40% undecided. My guess is that 40 might shrink to half of that if you were to say, ask people generally, do you think he committed the charges, the, the uh, acts that he's charged with, my guess is most people have already made a determination about his guilt or innocence, which means that's going to be extra effort to make sure we get a yeah. jury that can set aside those beliefs. Yeah. 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 So it's not that you have them, it's your ability to set them aside. Yep, that's right. Okay. That's right. I would think that if you search their social media and there was no sign anywhere of any opinion on it, that that would be an ideal juror. Uh, probably, but you know, I, I, I've said before, so let's find someone 
um, in the Trump case, for instance, that in essence lives under a rock. They don't even know he was the former president. They have no idea. That's the perfect person right there. Oh, yes. <laughs> really want someone who's so divorced from reality that they live under a rock. And now we're going to put them in charge of making a decision on matters of real consequence. That's just the because problem. they don't just because they don't watch the news at all or have made the ch uh, conscious choice to, to know nothing about current events doesn't mean they don't have a sense of justice. You don't know who the no. That's true. That in fairness, that's true. But you don't even know that the per, the defendant charge was the former president of the United States. Uh, unlikely, I, I grant you, it is unlikely. But I don't, I don't know if they, if there's anything about that that makes oh, them fair, fair bad enough. jurors. It may not be disqualifying. There, there may be some people that fit a profile there. They're, they're, they read novels. They're, they're read. They, they do other things. But because, listen, Ben, because of all the problems, uh, when we start to look at D.C. and politics, they have unplugged, literally completely unplugged, and they don't stay connected to the news. Yeah, right. That may be someone that st does have a, a sense of justice. Like Mount, <laughs> Mountain Man Joe went off the, <laughs> went off the grid. Yeah. Mountain Man Joe, do you have an opinion? I don't even know what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, do you, he... he Mountain Man Joe could easily have a you know a sense of right right and wrong and be able to follow directions. Could I know? Okay, uh, one thing, an observation I want to make is in the beginning, nobody seemed to want to you know really accuse a former president of these horrible things. It was anathema. It was oh we can't, we can't possibly go there. This is unprecedented. Blah blah blah. I would think a former president would be held to a higher standard with this fiduciary sort of position of trust and that it, it would be not a problem at all. I don't have any problem with charging any president with, uh, with anything from either side if it looks like there's a possibility they did it. And I'm, I'm sort of interested to see if there's a cascade effect now that that seal has been broken. It's like, yeah, well, Boom, 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 charge, charge, charge. The, the, the world didn't come to an end. Former president charged. I wonder if that will, will be bad for the pre former president. Like the fact that that's no longer a novel thing. Well, these are pretty serious charges that are designed to undercut our democracy. I don't think even with this precedent set, you would see former presidents charged with relatively minor offenses. Um, and, and I do think the reason that we sort of reject the notion that he should have been charged or should be charged at all is that it's, again, to, to quote Chris Christie, it's beneath the dignity of the office of the president of the United States to think that he's no different than Tony Soprano um, running the, the the crew he ran down in New Jersey, because more and more often we are seeing, um, or at least the, the evidence would seem to indicate that there, it was, there was a criminal enterprise present surrounding the former president, and he was the leader of that. And that's, I think that's difficult for us all to accept that this might be the case. So I think in our heart of hearts, no, we don't want former presidents charged. We want them to be like Jimmy Carter and uh, George W. Bush to go off into the sunset and do presidential things. Um, but but the fact is, if you've done things while in office, uh, before office, after office that are criminal, no one is above the law. OK, is there anything we didn't cover? No, I think we're covered it. I just okay. think it, 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 people worry, and there's an interesting aspect of it is, where does that right of free speech meet the right of fair trials? And while we want uh, more information, and right. by the way, how about if we all want more information, which I think we do, well, why aren't we publicizing Trump's trial down in New York? Why aren't we televising that? Why don't we televise the trials that are going to take place in the federal court Federal courts have a prohibition on uh, cameras in the courtroom. I think it might be time that, that that edict be removed so that people can actually see what the evidence is, not filtered through someone else's reporting. Right. Uh, and I have 
and one more observation, and that is, I don't know if you've noticed, but in on places like CNN and MSNBC, uh, bloggers, video bloggers that are really good, like Brian Tyler Cohen, who has is now partnered up with Glenn Kirshner, who you may have mm-hmm. seen on TV. They they get used now on on those real platforms like CNN, etc., as commenters. And I wonder if they would, if there's any point where we'll see a person named Turtle Boy on CNN, and if and having, you know, regardless of how successful you become, if a name like Turtle Boy becomes a hindrance to, to your <laughs> your success. So yeah, this is a you know so and so on CNN. Let's go to our correspondent Turtle Boy. <laughs> He has an actual name, I believe. It's Aiden Kearney. Okay. Um, and and I hear what you're saying, but I think this story is already going to be featured on either Dateline uh, or 2020 because it's it's already it's not just garnered publicity around here, but n- national interest as to what actually took place and and whether the police and law enforcement did their job properly or whether this is all a smoke screen by the defendant. It'll be an interesting case. And in Massachusetts, we do allow cameras in the courtroom. So that that trial will be televised. And the likelihood is Court TV will broadcast it as well because it's got that level of national interest. So uh, it'll be an interesting case to see as it unfolds and to see um, what really, or at least what the evidence indicates likely took place. Do you get the sense that I got to stop talking at some point. But do you get the sense that uh, Trump is burning out? When you see him in the courtroom, man, his face is on fire. He's so angry. Uh, He's probably not getting a lot of sleep. How long long can he how long can he keep this up? Who would get a lot of sleep at this point? I mean, you know, to, to borrow his phrase, he looks these days. He looks like he's low energy. Um, And the fact is, I think we all would be, you know, we're in our 70s. We just want to, at some point, spend the rest of our days fishing and you'd think having having good conversations with Bradley J. You'd think, and, and instead he's facing a multitude of criminal charges, and statistically, statistically you can't you can't win them all, and you won't win them all. And so the 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 case in New York is going to strip him of some of the assets or the fraud in the business dealings. The other cases likely. At least one of them will result in a period of incarceration. You uh, think that there's a there's a chance that he would go to jail? Yes, yes, I think that's what happens if you choose to try it, and you wait till the end. I think as these dominoes are falling in the Georgia case, the folks that are getting out early are the lawyers that made an assessment. <laughs> I'm not going to jail for him. And so there'll be more that falls. So the question is, who's going to be left at the end of the day? And the way we work, the way our system works, is the early folks get a good deal. The people at the end are going to be holding the bag. So if it's him and Rudy at the end of this trying this case, 15 of the co-conspirators will now be likely offering some testimony against him. You're not going to beat all those charges, and you're going to be convicted on something. And if you make us try the case, then you don't get the cushy probation that some of the early settlers did, the pilgrims. You're going to get incarceration because you forced us to this expense. You don't show remorse. And now it's time to pay the piper. And I know, as, as Phil says, he sleeps just fine. He, sociopaths sleep just fine despite facing all these criminal charges and the, the idea of spending the end of your days in prison. Um, I don't know where they're at that level, but I certainly, and I don't think you would be sleeping well at this point. No, if most, mostly he's running for president to stay out of jail. If I were him and I could cut a deal and said, all right, all right, I, fine. I'm not going to run for president. Just, just let me go. Let me be. I would so make the deal, go hang out in Mar-a-Lago and live life. I don't, there's something wrong with the dude. Well, would you, because that's yeah. the thing I think about, because let's suppose you're the government now. Would you would you cut that deal? Because it's part of it that he can't run for office because then he's going to say, see, I told you it was corrupt from the outset. They were just trying to stop me from um, running for president again. 
you'd need, I think, some type of se- him admitting some type of serious criminal violation, okay. felony of some significant scope. Yeah. That would then potentially preclude him from uh, being elected president. I Is, mean, are there any char- any other are there well, any charges would, that preclude you? I, I think it would be like a sedition or a treason charge. I would think renders you ineligible to be president. I haven't looked at it recently, but 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 that's the problem is if you cut a deal and the deal just requires him not to run for president, he is still going to be talking about how he's been railroaded and all the rest. And and that's not good for us no. to feel the divisions that all of this has created. So I, I you'd have to look at the charges and see if there are some charges okay. that would actually disqualify him. One thing that's good about these people taking the plea is they acknowledge the crimes were committed at, so the public can see. That's super yep. important. Yep. So, yep, uh, doubting you, doubting Thomas's and doubting, <laughs> doubting Mary's. Yeah, there was a crime. The, the, whatever news sources you were watching that says there was no crime were wrong. There was there there were crimes, and they cop to it, and that's that's healthy for the country. One you know, thing I got. One go thing, I, as I'm thinking about it, I think the documents case that one of the charges there could render him ineligible to be elected president. The, the one that borders on the treason and the, the transfer of this confidential information to others. I think one of those charges might be disqualifying if he were to plead to that for being elected president. That's my recollection. Well, Phil says something does get said uh, that the state charges are good because of the next Republican president can't pardon him. I want to just say, isn't it time to look at that notion of pardons? As a that's an archaic and that's not good. You first of all pardon yourself. What kind of BS <laughs> is it? What kind of BS is that? Maybe you can, but they ought to fix that. And you shouldn't be able to just go around pardoning people. Why does the president? Have, why is there a a power like that for a president? Oh yeah. You know, Roger Stone, you're off the hook. That's Steve that's so awful. Um, yeah, why? Well, that just, should be fixed. Just because it's been abused doesn't mean there isn't a reasonable basis for it that we should continue. Governors have the ability to pardon for state charges as well. And I think what we're, we're seeing is the extreme situation here. We're a Roger Stone and a Steve Bannon who clearly committed criminal acts, significant criminal acts, then benefit because of their relationship with the president. There's even some suggestion that some of these pardons were bought and paid for. Um, but but so the fact that they've been abused doesn't mean you eliminated the ability to, to provide that in the future. What it means is we have to be more selective about the people we give that power to. And unfortunately, um, that here, it does look like there's been significant abuse of that. I would not remove it completely because I think there's a good basis for it for the president or the governor to be able to provide justice. Should that power reside in one person or maybe a bipartisan committee of five? Well, that's an inter- That's a better. That's a better solution and a more interesting one. Um, but again, you know, think about other powers the president of the United States has. He can declassify any piece of information regardless of the potential consequences we give presidents too and, much too much power um yeah except let's go down to congress and look at how they operate when they're supposed to work together and legislate and arrive at a solution yeah i it, suppose it's paralysis at some point you got to have somebody that can say some make a definitive decision all right okay fair enough Fair enough, boss. Okay. I think this was my favorite one ever that we ever <laughs> have ever well, done. Let's hope it's other people's favorite one, but it's fun. It's great seeing you again. Yep, great seeing you again. And once again, folks, if you or someone you know is interested in maybe a career in law, <laughs> check out the Massachusetts School of Law, of which our guest, Dean Mike Coyne, is the dean. Thanks so much, and all Thanks, the best Bradley. to you. Thank okay, you. Let bye, me, folks. Bye, folks.